Revelation, unless it wasn't started yet, then I just had nothing of it. All right. Now, Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. I also want to say, and I'll say again in the next service, to all who came last night and helped, thank you so much. Uh, we did that when we had the church in Darwin, and uh, both my wife and I said it was a much more enjoyable experience having a heap of helpers than it was when it was just my wife and I and uh, our children when they were very young, and Katie when she was a toddler. And so it was very good. Uh, my wife spent most of her time running after Katie. You know, this time she spent most of her time running after Thomas. But anyways, um, it was really good. I lost track of how many we gave out. Uh, it was hundreds and hundreds. When I was on the platform, every family I saw with children had balloons. Um, had invitations to the church and all those types of things. And uh, immediately afterwards, um, the organizer came up to me and said, December 6th, next year, you in? <laughs> and so we're already booked, December 6th. I want to find something yeah. December 6th. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, December 6th, next year, put it in your calendars. Uh, we'll be back again, and um, we'll go for that. So anyways, that was, a, that was a good experience. I don't know about you, but we've got to, to have a lot of good conversations with people. And there's at least on the way out at least 20 parents who stopped and thanked us um, on their way out. And so uh, it was really good. Several people tried to pay us, and we said, no, thank you. We just want to wish Merry Christmas to our community. And uh, several people asked us if they could book us to do their kids' birthdays. <laughs> and, uh, we said, no, no, we're a church. Uh, you're welcome to come to church and, and the children's ministries, but uh, we don't do birthday parties yet. She said, they said, okay, okay. Uh, but anyway, it's a great way to get into the community, get involved, yeah. meet people, uh, those type of things. Revelation chapter 19, looking at the second coming of Christ. Um, and uh, kind of fitting because we're commemorating the first coming of Christ and we're looking at the second coming of Christ. And so, uh, look at verse 11. It says, And I saw the heaven opened, and behold, the white horse, and he that sat upon it was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but him, he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of, his, of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So we'll stop there for a moment. So as we begin to look at Christ's return, now on your handouts, if you have them, it's just blank, so you can take notes as you as you see fit. It's not filling the blank uh, this morning. As we begin to come into this, this scene and we see the heavens open, uh, the first thing you're going to notice is what? Uh, that, that when he, Christ returns, he comes riding a white horse, right? Uh, and then uh, you'll see that his name is called Faithful and True. You notice that later on it talks about um, his name was what? The Word of God. Does that bring back to memory John 1.1? 1, 1? In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. Alright, so that's a consistent thing all the way through. And, and then we get to looking at his appearance. His appearance, now, his appearance is one that you probably would rather be on the white horse riding with than see coming. What did you think? Couldn't you say why? His appearance is very different than he came the first time. The very first time Christ came, what? He came as a baby. Yeah. A help. Have you ever think about that? Have you, ever, have you ever had a child and you hold a baby and you think, Jesus came like this. We think the God who created everything and how absolutely helpless a baby is, and that was him. And so uh, it's, it's been interesting to think about that. But his appearance when he comes the second time is different. The Bible says his eyes are as a flame of fire. 
verse 12. Uh, nothing escapes Christ's notice. Doesn't, doesn't that go along with the fact that he knows all and he sees all? He's omniscient and he's omnipotent. You know, he is everywhere at all times and he can see all. And so we see that. And uh, verse 12 also tells us um, that he wears many crowns and on his head were many crowns. All right? Those marking of rank and authority. And the fact that he wears many crowns signifies that he alone is sol the sovereign ruler of the earth. All right? he, he rules everything. It was customary when it, in the ancient world, like in biblical times, for a conquering king to collect all the crowns of the nations he conquered. Is that, you know, so as he went through and he, you know, as Rome went through and conquered the world, you know, they would take the crown from the king and the king would co have a crown collection. Amen. The king would have a crown collection. Um, so would it be fitting that Jesus, who would be the ruler of the whole world, earth, would come with many crowns? Makes you wonder, does each one of those crowns represent a kingdom or something? You know, kind of think about those things. But, and so here we are, we, we, we see this now. He had a name written um, that no man knew but he himself. Now, this is the second of three names given to Christ in this chapter. Okay? It's the second one. Now, it's pointless to speculate about what that name is. Why? Because the Bible says, who's the only one who knows that name? Him. Correct? And something about us as humans, don't we like to, if, if Scripture doesn't tell us what His name is that only He knows, don't we like to speculate? Try to figure it out? I, I know no one knows but Him, but it's Him and me now because I figured it out. Can I give you, save yourself some trouble? Don't try to figure it out. If only He knows, only He knows. I bet you though it'll be fine. When you see it, you'll know it, right? When he reveals what it is, whatever it is, if he ever does. And if he doesn't reveal it, did you need to know it? Probably not, correct? And so don't waste all the time going, I wonder what that name is. I think that name is this, and I think that name is this. Just leave it alone. Just know that he has a name that no man knows, all right, but himself. And then we see uh, his robe was dipped in blood in verse 13, right? <coughs> Now that blood there is not talking of redemption. That's not blood from the cross, okay? That's the picture of judgment. Because when he comes this time, he's going to conquer everything. Right? When he comes this time, we're going to have that battle where the blood is up to the horse's bridle and then the devil and all that will be cast into hell, locked up for a thousand years, yes? Won't that be nice? Do you ever think if you if you die or go in the rapture and then you come back, you're going to be coming back for a thousand years to an earth with no devil, no demonic influence, none of it. And yet, yet after a thousand years or however long they live, uh, living with Christ ruling in a world of peace, right? There will still be another rebellion. Well, I guess if you can rebel out of the Garden of Eden, you can rebel out of the Millennial Kingdom, correct? Now, think about it. We'll get to that when we get to the Millennial Kingdom in a little while. And then we see the name that was revealed is the Word of God. All right? Then we see in verse 14, it talks about Christ's army that's coming in. Isn't it interesting that Christ is the only king that when he comes with his army intact, it never says that you and I as the army ever lift a hand, say a word, do a thing other than ride a white horse and white linen, clean and fine. Isn't that nice? Doesn't that picture most of life? Like, we don't do a thing for salvation. Christ does everything for us. And so, when he comes again to judge the earth, he takes care of himself. We just ride a white horse, right? Imagine if, you, if you're going to ride a right horse in from heaven, 
the view coming in, you know, probably not the view you want to see in the end, but it happens. All right, so we see that, and uh, we see him, him coming back with, with all his armies, and then we, we begin to look at his rule. His rule talks about that starting in verse 15. He had a sword, uh, a sharp sword coming out of his mouth. The fiery words of judgment will destroy uh, unredeemed Gentile nations. So with the same mouth, Christ will destroy the wicked one. And God's word is powerful and sharper than what? Any two-edged sword, according to Hebrews. And so that, that it goes there. And then uh, we see in verse 15 uh, that he should smite the nations. There, people talk about a battle at the end here. There really is no battle. A battle assumes that the other side has a chance to fight back. Correct? You know, if you're, if, you're, if you're watching, have you ever watched a sporting game that went back and forth and back and forth? And, oh man, there's a real battle for who's going to win the game. A battle implies both sides are equally fighting and equally as strong. Correct? Most of the time. Well, this is really a battle because they they don't fight. Get a chance, right? He strikes the nations. The sword is deadly and will instantly kill all those who rebel. And uh, God will uh, save those who are you know saved out of the Gentile nations in Israel, and that will include those who gathered for the battle of Armageddon, as well as the rest of the unredeemed uh, who will be judged and. Uh, we'll see that in, in, in Scripture, you can see that. And then he rules with a rod of iron, verse 15 as well, and he treads the winepress um, with his wrath. And Returning to God's wrath, the winepress symbolizes the fierceness of the wrath of God. Now, we has anyone ever seen a winepress? Yeah. The interesting thing, because you, you feed the grapes with like kind of rollers, and you feed the grapes in it, just smashes them and just gets all the juice out, right? It's a wine press. And until you see how it just, they come out the other side, it gives you a better visual picture when it talks about God's wrath pressed like a wine press. Right? And um, it's just an interesting thing there that we see. And, well, um, in a Jewish wine press. Yeah, and that's different as well. Which is a bunch of people have you seen those type of wine presses as well? I'm sorry, this may date me or tell something about me, judge me if you will, but it reminds me of like I Love Lucy. Where do we go from the wine press and the wrath of the net? Okay, thanks, Brian. Blame it on Noah. Um, he's used to those. No, anyways. So, you, you know, those have wine press as well when you just stand and smash the grapes. And anyways, it gives you a good visual image when the wrath of God is spoken of like a wine press. Okay? And then we see also the name written on his vesture and on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Right? So in John's vision of the returning king, he sees Christ wearing that, that, that banner, that robe, and uh, on this banner is the third name given to him in this chapter. Correct? First name is? If you give me an answer, you're wrong. We don't know what the first name is. That was a trick question. First name is? The unknown name but his. Him. All right? Second name was? God of God. Word of God. Word of God. Word of God. Third name was? King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All right? No worries. I just want to see if you're going to give me a name for the first one or not. His name is? Yeah. No, never mind. Question mark. We don't know. He, he knows. All right? We already went over that. So that's the, that's the third name. Now, uh, we'll probably you stop there, um, and we'll talk about Christ's victory when we, when we come back. It won't be, what's next Sunday? Yeah, it will be next Sunday, and then we won't have this the following Sunday. My goal was to finish it by the start of the new year. It didn't happen. We'll, we'll get there, though. And when we finish the last couple of lessons of this, then we'll start prayer. But 
All right. Now, we'll take some prayer requests. And uh, 